Um, as per schedule, the first speaker is going to be uh, Ms. Shahzad Akbar, the chairperson of the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission. Um, Ms. Akbar, I will start the recording and I will, uh, you will be the first person to speak uh, uh, in um, one minute. Uh, so. Maybe such Thank you. Um, greetings, colleagues and friends. I'm really grateful for all of you being here. Um, my deepest appreciation to the panelists and to moderator, Mr. Rahimi. Um, I first want to take um, a minute to just um, say condolence and share the grief that I'm sure is collective grief about the horrific news today about the attack on Holo. Holo Trust, uh, the miners. Um, we are grateful for the work of the miners in Afghanistan. As someone who has grown up in war, uh, I have firsthand seen the impact of their work in saving lives, particularly lives of children. Um, it makes no sense to us, to me, I think to no one, why this happened. And, and we have immense grief. And as before, um, we in the commission hope that there would be investigation and justice because this culture of impunity is just taking too many lives away. Um, of course, also, um, as you know, we are extremely concerned about the ongoing violence and the levels of violence. Every day, our colleagues on the ground um, um, share really heartbreaking reports about um, the plight of civilians. Um, roads are being blocked. People don't have access to services. Uh, communications is being cut. Um, there is major internal displacement. So as we watch the situation, um, we remain, but really the real hope for us is that uh, there would be intensified efforts at talks and that we would see the possibility of a ceasefire. Um, I just want to give you also a little bit of a context for this paper and this discussion. Um, as the peace negotiations were going on in Doha, um, the commission decided to do a series of discussion papers on important human rights issues to then be launched, we were hoping, at the Doha, uh, and, and Doha itself, um, and provide some food for thought for both negotiating teams as well as recommendations. Uh, we worked with, with a group of excellent Afghan experts, all Afghan experts, including Dr. Saeed Kuma Saeed, who is on, on this call today, on a range of issues. Uh, um, so we have prepared seven discussion papers, uh, women's rights and peace, um, equality as driver for peace, which is on equality in citizenship, um, freedom of expression and um, assembly. Uh, we also um, worked on a paper on uh, housing uh, land and property, rights of housing land and property. We worked on corruption, corruption as an obstacle for uh, access to human rights, as well as specific recommendations for both sides to uh, prevent uh, further institutionalization of corruption in a peace agreement or through a peace agreement. Um, we worked on a paper on amnesty, uh, which was also sort of released, uh, related to the prisoner release, but also broader questions of amnesty and the peace process and issues of victim-centered justice, and a paper on reparations focused on uh, victims of war and some thinking about what are their legal rights and international law and Afghan law and um, what are the issues for consideration of both teams. We were hoping one, while we were working on these papers last, um, last year in the winter, we were hoping that by this time the conversation on the content of the peace process would have moved forward and we could have used these papers, um, um, all of them, uh, to enrich the discussions around these issues, around human rights issues in the peace process. That's not the case, but that should not, of course, stop us from continuing to um, bring, shine a light on these issues and bring, uh, push these issues, these issues forward. In fact, before launching this paper, we had a discussion internally about would this be the right moment to launch these papers, considering the fact that 
um, not much is happening in Doha, but we felt it's important to keep the energy and momentum around peace and, and human rights alive. And we decided to start with this most important discussion, women's rights in the peace process. Um, um, I, just, uh, I just wanted to offer you that context. Um, I'm hoping that we'll be soon able to invite you to our other um, discussions on other issues that I, uh, as I listed. And I look forward to a very lively discussion today. I know that women's rights, um, I mean, this is a moment in, Perhaps we need many more discussions on this issue for all of us to also look back in the women's rights journey as we are inspired by the women's rights movement in Afghanistan to look back on the journey and think ahead in the next about the next few months and weeks, how to better strategize to not only protect uh, women's human rights, but also expand opportunities for access to rights for women and girls across Afghanistan. Because although we have a, well, we have a, a, a legal, a framework that could be improved, but is not horrible. There is a lot of work that needs to be done to make um, um, access to human rights and access to women's rights a reality for every woman and every girl across Afghanistan. And we have seen in the past 20 years, there are so many barriers to access, including the location, the co conflict, the locations that you live. And of course, um, experience of lived experience of women have varied greatly from urban to rural areas and from secure to less secure areas. I look forward to a fascinating discussion by our uh, panelists and our moderator, and uh, I thank them again on behalf of the Commission. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Ms. Akbar, um, Chair, the Chairperson of the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission. Um, without further ado, I would uh, uh, like to start our discussion. Um, uh, although our um, star panelists need no introduction, but as is the uh, tradition, I will briefly introduce all the panelists. Very shortly, uh, obviously their impressive portfolios cannot be covered in the few minutes that you're allocating for introductions. Uh, but um, I will still nonetheless try to give you a brief uh, introduction. Uh, today we have with us Dr. Habiba uh, Sorabi, uh, who is a member of the negotiation uh, negotiating team of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. Dr. Sorabi has held many positions in the government, including the governor of Bamiyan, where uh, she was the first um, uh, female governor in, in Afghanistan's history, and uh, she also served as a minister of women's affairs uh, in the Afghan government. Uh, we are very pleased to have Dr. Srabi with us. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, the second uh, speaker, just the order I have in front of me, there's no order really, uh, is Dr. Urzala Nemat. Uh, uh, she's the director of Afghanistan Research and Evaluation Unit, a leading uh, uh, research uh, uh, think tank based in Afghanistan. She's an Afghan scholar and civil society activist. She has founded many civil uh, society organizations focusing on children, youth, and women issues in Afghanistan. Thank you very much, Dr. Nemat, for being here. Uh, next, we have Maria, uh, Mari Akrami, Ms. Mari Akrami, uh, who's the Executive Director of Afghanistan's uh, Women Network. Uh, uh, she's the founder of um, Afghan Women Skills Development Center, uh, which, was, uh, which is the uh, first organization uh, to establish a shelter um, or safe house for victims of uh, violence in Afghanistan. She's been named uh, the first, uh, she's been uh, named uh, by BBC as 100 women uh, 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 most inspirational and influential women of the year 2016. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Akrami, for being here. Um, next, we have Dr. Huma Saeed with us. Um, Dr. Saeed is a senior research on human rights and transitional justice at the Lewin University. She has conducted extensive research on, Afghan, uh, on transformative and tra transitional justice in Afghanistan. Uh, she was also involved in the development of the current uh, uh, position paper that we'll be discussing today. And um, last, but certainly not least, we have uh, Ms. Uh, Heather Bar with us. Uh, she is the interim co-director of the Women's Rights Division at the Human Rights Watch. At Human rights Watch. She's a human rights researcher who's been involved in human rights research in Afghanistan for more than a decade. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Barr, for joining us. Um, without further ado, I would like to start by posing the first question uh, to um, Dr. Sarabi. Uh, as a person who's been directly involved in the uh, negotiation between, uh, between Afghanistan's government and the Taliban, 
how would you assess the woman's participation in the peace process so far? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Rahimi. Thank you, uh, uh, Ms. Sharzad Akbar and her dedicated team for uh, preparation of this event and also for the paper that uh, provided. Uh, and it's really uh, uh, good to, to have this, this type of research and paper uh, with the critical time that uh, we are on the base of the negotiation or going uh, toward peace. Uh, uh, good afternoon and good morning to everyone. So, some of us, uh, even we are uh, still it's, it's morning. Uh, very pleased to be here. I want to touch upon two, two issues. One is, uh, of course, the question that you have all, you asked about this, uh, uh, the representation or the position of women in the negotiation team. The other one that uh, how is uh, currently the negotiation is going on because it's also very important to to make it clear for our audience, for the, our, our uh, follow member from our country that uh, what's going on in Doha. So the position, the, the, the member of the uh, negotiation team, we are 21 uh, among the 21 member of the negotiating team. Uh, four of us, we are women. Of course, the number, it's the, which is we are, our target was even in the NAPO or the um, uh, uh, resolution 1325, the, we our target was 30 percent but it's not 30 percent but at least four of us we are committed we have a strong voice we are there to uh, to pass all the uh, the voice of uh, of one, uh, women on the negotiation table uh, not only uh, with a contact group that uh, it will be a small uh, small group uh, four or five from each side there will be a, a woman uh, from our side of course you know that uh, from Taliban so there is no any women participating in the negotiation or not neither to the any conference that held in international conference but for the contact group there there is a woman always uh, uh, to uh, directly negotiate with the taliban and also any committee that we are set uh, set up for example the the, uh, the media committee and all also human rights and uh, vulnerability group uh, committee and also the other one is the research and, and law and uh, um, also the political committee for each of these committee there is one woman because we wanted to have a strong voice and uh, on the uh, on the uh, for each committee and also to to share our thought and uh, our comments when there will be some some paper some issue some discussion for the policy we have to be there so this is uh, uh, this is the the policy that we are working with the um, uh, negotiating team. But uh, of course, uh, having uh, women on the uh, national reconciliation and uh, there were a lot of advocacy for that to have more women. But uh, there are, I, I, I think, uh, more than twenty percent of of women uh, existing, including Mary John. But uh, she will. Uh, she will share that uh, how how many people uh, how many women are on the uh, high council or high reconciliation council existing. When we are on the uh, um, negotiating team and talking about the peace process, we are not talking only about the women issue. Any policy, any document, any any issue that related to the uh, um, Afghan people or um, which will be men and women. We are uh, we we are uh, um, committed to share our thought and and to make it if there is another committee, a ceasefire committee, uh, two of us, me and ceasefire committee as well. Uh, of course, uh, with the support uh, group uh, that the peace support group, Norway, uh, UNAMO. Uh, all, we uh, made a um, uh, inclusion uh, policy paper, and it's uh, something that uh, for not only for the women inclusion, but the minority for different ethnic group, youth, and uh, this a policy that, that your, uh, the structure of the, uh, the negotiating team. But uh, the negotiation or the talk 
what's this, the correct unfortunately uh, especially on the second round, which was started uh, on the uh, 5th of January, the Taliban willingness for the uh, negotiated to come for negotiation because mostly they are uh, waiting for the decision that may uh, made in in United States. Of course, they were waiting for the uh, uh, for the uh, in, in the new government that started, and after that, for the review of the agreement between the um, uh, United States and Taliban, and after that, of course, some some other conference, and also uh, um, uh, after that, uh, the Turk. Uh, want to be uh, to, to not uh, commit, uh, committed for uh, for negotiation mostly they are uh, making time they are killing time or, or saving time for themselves to uh, or, or waiting for the first of may when the announcement for the uh, withdrawal of the uh, the troop happened and now they are i think uh, they are again making excuse to uh, wait for the 11th of September for the uh, end of, of this uh, uh, pull out. So this is something that Taliban always uh, playing game and they don't uh, have a kind of honesty for honesty policy for the negotiation. So um, uh, we are trying to uh, uh, to talk with the international community with the peace support group to bring uh, and also for the uh, regional country and it's uh, uh, diplomacy is going with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and and, and also with the um, uh, uh, chair uh, chairman or head of the negotiating team and the um, uh, council high council for reconciliation to uh, to make a clear diplomacy or, or a strong diplomacy with the uh, neighboring country with the regional country to bring Taliban for the meaningful and real negotiation that which is uh, uh, still it's not going very well. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that comprehensive uh, uh, remarks. And um, I would just have one follow up question. Um, what how do you assess the Taliban's engagement with the women members of the negotiation team? There have been a conflicting reports as to how women representatives on the negotiation team were received by the Taliban. There were reports that they uh, were disengaging with them or there were reports that uh, were engaging with them. Can you just uh, enlighten us with that uh, aspect of it? There are two, two types of uh, um, uh, reaction. One is that the Taliban are uh, uh, seeing us or, or uh, in, in the lobby or somewhere else. Most of the time they want to ignore because this is their, um, uh, they have their behavior. Uh, so that uh, to not uh, um, to not look to women wanted to ignore not greeting with them, and it even happened to me when we had uh, uh, for uh, a meeting with the, uh, the national uh, national council of the Qataris people, and when we uh, returned back to uh, to, uh, uh, to a hotel at the lobby of the hotel, uh, I was with the minister of of peace together. And they were greeting with minister, but they wanted to ignore me. And after that, of course, I, I didn't want to uh, greet as well and, and I went to my room. And But when we are at the table or plenary meeting, um, with the plenary, plenary meeting also, we have seen some, of, uh, some kind of uh, insulting reaction, for example, uh, I have, uh, I, we were witness or we, uh, uh, we saw Saw that when the Fauzi uh, Kofi talked, and one of them even covered the face with 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 uh, uh, his uh, his handkerchief or with, the, uh, with like a chadar. But uh, with the contact group, they are normal. They are talking. They are uh, looking face to face and listening to us. Uh, they are uh, receiving us as a member of of a negotiating team, not a a, a woman. This is something that uh, they wanted to be a kind of uh, different because they have uh, they have been asked by several people about this issue. So on the contact group, they are uh, a little bit normal. Thank you so much for that answer. Uh, it just highlights how important it is for the woman participation to have an institutional support 
um, given the Taliban's unwillingness to engage with them uh, outside of the, the formal institutional setting. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to ask the second question from uh, Dr. Nemeth. Um, given your research, and I'm sure you've been following up the, 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 uh, the, the peace process, uh, how do you assess the place of women rights in priorities and goals of all the stakeholders involved in the peace process? Obviously, government, uh, Taliban are the two main parties, but also international community regional actors are involved. Uh, thank you, Dr. Saibrahimi. Um, Salam alaikum to everyone, um, uh, distinguished panelists, uh, uh, distinguished chair of the Independent Human Rights Commission. Thank you very much for providing this uh, facility, uh, this opportunity for us to, to have such an important uh, discussion on, on a question that is repeatedly asked, repeatedly raised, but unfortunately not much done at different levels. And I think, um, it, as you mentioned, it's important to start from who are the parties to conflict, um, the international community, the government, the Taliban, and many other actors that are also engaged here, the Afghan political elites, for example, the other armed groups are also uh, uh, there and they have to be noted. But I highlight mostly in, in sort of unpacking a little bit the positioning of different three major parties, the international community, the government, and the Taliban. With regard to international community, we see um, um, a, a level of decline in, in, in engaging with, with human rights. There we see a kind of a, a double sort of way of looking at things. So in the sort of on the record uh, statements, uh, uh, written statements or speeches, reaction to incidents in Afghanistan, particularly targeting women assassination and so forth, uh, there is always a very clear position that they stand with the Afghan woman, that they emphasize on the preserving of the achievements of the last 20 years, particularly in terms of women's rights and women's position in the politics and in the decision makings. So if we follow that side of the approach, we do have a support of women's um, position in public and in decision making and in the peace process by international community. However, big players sort of uh, pragmatically speaking big players or some of the significant players of the international community such as special envoys of the us for afghanistan and, and i mean just giving one example we see also another approach being followed as well and that is you know that the case of women's rights is an internal matter it has to be taken care of by yourselves we are off we pack and leave and then you know in your country it's more of an internal matter. This is an approach that is not openly uh, available on record. Nobody says this very like publicly, but that is really de facto way of uh, looking at things. And when I say or raise the question of decline in international positioning towards women, I mean, mostly mean this because indirectly through some sort of an informal mechanisms or informal channels, this is a, what is communicated that the time is up, we are leaving, and so we deal here with what has uh, been the consequences of this war. So generally, uh, that's one aspect. Another point I want to mention regarding women, uh, international communities position, at least a good news although, in terms of regional play players as well, is a unilateral positioning in terms of uh, not being fully agreed with a return of the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. Uh, the statements from Russia, for example, was very important. Uh, China having the presidency of the UN uh, Security Council during the last month has made it very clear that they are strongly mm -hmm. against the idea of uh, uh, Taliban's uh, sort of uh, uh, being behind, you know, civilian casualties, being behind assassinations and so forth. Mm -hmm. So there are these important positive factors, but at the same time, there are concerns, as I said, in terms of that approach of this being a matter of international internal affairs and we have to take care of it. Now, with, with the government's positioning, what's happening is that um, somehow it's in the strategic interest of the, the current government. We know that thanks to the uh, tremendous level of pressure and advocacy by women groups, by women leaders, uh, um, uh, they succeeded to have our four uh, women delegation members uh, in a team of 21. So that was not an easy and straightforward process. We all are aware of that. 
Uh, secondly, we see that uh, uh, that also is a fact that when it comes to uh, overall position of women, uh, uh, women's uh, political position in terms of you know government's position, we see a decline in the uh, women's role in the political decision making. So that's something that has to be noted and has to be uh, looked at. Uh, because on the one hand, the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the Afghan government, when they are sort of more facing towards the, the Taliban, women's rights and preserving the achievements in the field of women's rights is a definite strong position that the government carries, and we are all very grateful for that. But on the other side, internally speaking, there are still uh, a level of decline being seen from government in terms of you know, ensuring that women are in the decision-making uh, positions that women are being consulted on different things. And that is also not uh, only government, but actually most of the political elites. Um, uh, Ms. Ami, former President Karzai, and says, still, you're meeting only like, with men and not including women in your consultation meetings. And now, whether a women uh, issue and women's rights is a priority or not, Taliban also have tailored way of messaging, uh, tailoring it based on the needs, based on the demands of the audience. So for the international community, they have been under an immense pressure to respond to this question. So you are Taliban. Taliban is a brand known for being against women. So how are you changing that? So if you look at the Taliban website, if you look at, for example, the open letter of Mullah Bradar to uh, the people of the United States, the women's rights was among the one of the three major messages that they had. And they always have a very sort of a, um, um, a conventional sort of a messaging of saying that we are not against women's rights. We will ensure this. And that's uh, something that they use as repeatedly the same, very similar sort of language in their public statements. Uh, public statements like the international community, like the government of Afghanistan is something that they need. But the issue here is that when it uh, comes to the real realities on the ground, and I'm saying this again based on observation and evidence from across the country, uh, there is zero evidence that Taliban have changed their uh, positioning towards women, that even Taliban have changed their positions in terms of the basic rights of women and uh, girls' education, for example. And to simply put it, as one of my um, colleagues, um, activists in the field of education says, if Taliban claim and I hope they are hearing me saying is the, putting this challenge. If they claim that they are not against girls' education, then why we don't have any graduate female graduates from all those districts where they have very, very strong prisons or maybe control it to a level? So I have to also add with the Taliban, there is also this dilemma. When they were asked, uh, we all remember this uh, by media and by different uh, sort of you know um, channels. They first were emphasizing too much on, uh, you know, the future in terms of women's rights to be more based on the Sharia and based on the Islamic principles. Uh, with a lot of communications that they had through their political office with the international, you know, community, particularly with different uh, probably Islamic countries, they realized that they are going to be in trouble because Indonesia is also uh, an Islamic country, and the Dara Lefta head is a woman. So they 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 slowly jumped into saying that we want a pure Islamic in traditional the system. So they hide behind the Afghan uh, cultural and tradition in terms of saying what kind of situation they want for women. And I think they are in trouble with that as well, because we all are uh, aware of Afghanistan's diversity from north to south, east to central highlands, um, west and onwards and, and starting from the dress code to everything it's very different and traditions can differ from village to another village and even to family to other families so therefore i think taliban are in a state of confusion uh, uh, they are aware of the fact that they cannot really con could be considered neither by the afghan society nor by international community as a force that has brought some changes their political messaging is uh, one thing, their practices are unfortunately the same, uh, uh, another thing. So to conclude, um, all different parties, and of course I haven't mentioned about you know, the, the other groups, uh, if we sort of consider them for a moment separate from the Taliban, for example, the Daesh and everything, it's very crystal clear that they are against any element of humanity, let alone women, 
uh, as part of the humanity. So their behavior is completely inhumanistic uh, as a branch of Taliban or as an independent group of Taliban. So uh, in some uh, women's rights uh, is only priority for government. Uh, is it a real priority and a genuine and honest priority or not? Uh, yes and no. It is a priority when the government of Afghanistan is facing with uh, a group like Taliban. They definitely have that flag quite strongly raised. When they are facing back towards society, back towards the realities of actual and effective role of women in the decision making, they still have a long way to go and we have to sort of uh, take it from there. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and I would like to highlight what you just said, which is very important. When Taliban are pressed on the Islamic merits of their position, they tend to defend it based on tradition. And when they are pressed um, and they're faced with the, with the wealth of diversity of Afghan tradition, they go back to Islam. This, this, uh, this is something that I've actually observed in my own research when you study the laws enacted during the time of Taliban, the laws that had to do with restrictions of women. Often they cited Afghan tradition, honor, sharaf, and those terms along with Islamic tradition, which shows that um, they feel like there is something lacking on both fronts to justify their position. Um, but thank you so much for um, articulating that um, um, so elegantly. Uh, the next question I would like to ask uh, Ms. Uh, Akram, uh, Ms. Akrami, um, a lot have been said about the importance of the role of uh, civil society and how even where we are today is thanks to the advocacy and the hard work of civil society. It was not the government voluntarily, uh, voluntarily uh, or as a matter of priority providing the, the uh, for participation of women. It was actually thanks to a lot of hard work of Afghan women that we are here at, even uh, where we are today. Um, given that, how do you assess the efforts of women rights organizations and broader civil society in ensuring women's uh, participation, rights, and as aspirations, ensuring that those are made central issues? In Thank you so much. Uh, let me, uh, let me uh, say hi to all my fellow and my friends. We are here, and thanks to uh, Abbas and Independent Human Rights Commission for organizing this event. Uh, and because to your questions, uh, I wanted to um, talk about AWN. Uh, AWN together with other coalitions, networks, organization, at national and international levels, that we have done a lot of lobby and advocacy for promoting and protecting women's human rights and is for a sustainable or just a sustainable peace. But that is all Afghans that we, we actually, our advocacy was for protecting all Afghans, which is including youth, minorities, women, men, all. Which I'm very glad and I thanks to Ursula John that she also has mentioned about that AWS from the beginning of the peace talk that we have done a lot of consultations, meetings across the country to mobilize women with different platforms that uh, we have uh, established like, uh, the coalition of half on women uh, for peace, uh, otherwise for our future, together as stronger. And as well, from the beginning of the peace talk that we try to have a lot of, a very loud voice that the women of Afghanistan will not go back and women of Afghanistan will, sh should be part of all the uh, process. And we have done a lot of campaigns, which is, uh, I also want to mention about the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission for the first campaign, which we raised for the ceasefire as the first priority for the people of Afghanistan. This effort was not done only by women. It was, AWN has enjoyed working with all women across the country, outside the country, which we have the privilege of some of friends from Afghan diaspora that we have tried to even advocate and mobilize uh, our friends, our women, advocates, even outside the country, that they should raise the voice of women. And I'm sure that due to that effort that now we, we see like uh, women and the negotiation teams, women at the um, IP sponsors, and also women at the different levels of Ministry of Peace, but it's still, this is not, we are not happy with that. It's really easy for even for government to just to uh, easily uh, deny and easily like ignore like what we have achieved during the last uh, 20 years and particularly that we can see what we have done. It was mainly like how to protect, how to, to protect all those achievements of Afghan people, particularly the women, which is 
I'm sure that without this support, without this lobby and advocacy, it was not possible. Even though we have tried to reach the Taliban, I had like the, um, I don't want to say because some of us was writing here, the Taliban has changed, but I actually, me and Shahzada and Dr. said that we had the opportunity in 2019 to meet him. And it was not easy, honestly, first, first time when we have met. But we have even success to convince them, some of them, to, they must to include women and they must to let us to meet with their women. Some of them, they said that it might be so early. We have approached, but unfortunately, uh, we haven't seen such a support or such interest from our international alliance. And they just try to either to ignore and discourage even us. They didn't support that from the beginning of the peace of the women of Afghanistan that they we get mobilized and we have even said that we want to go from our own budget. We wanted to go and we want to talk face to face. But unfortunately, it didn't happen till now. But this is not something that we just ignore and we just stop. We will continue our struggle, we will continue our efforts. And we really want to even right now, the women of Afghanistan have that courage, have that ability to talk to the Taliban face to face. To, they want to show the Taliban, show to the international community today is Afghanistan. Because the Taliban, when they talk and they just want to say that they are thinking about Afghanistan like 20 years before, or as uh, Dr. Ronzala mentioned, like uh, about some of friends that they have missed, if the Taliban just show that they are interested and they show, show that they are uh, willing to allow women. For me, I had the chance to even tell them <laughs> this is not their rights, that they give has that rights, that this is the woman of Afghanistan, woman should do this and that. Women of Afghanistan, according to the constitution, according to the civil law, according to the international laws, that they have the rights. And they even, they have access to their rights and they want to continue. But something that we really need to, to hear from the Taliban, the women of Afghanistan, it's not easy for them to trust, and it is because we right now we see continuously this, the war is going on continuously that we see that the those area which is under control of Taliban, we haven't seen any tangible like reasons that they show that there is the women have access to their basic rights. And this is really a, a still a, a question, and we still see that we have a long way to go forward. And I'm sure that in this, uh, I don't call it fight, but in this struggle. We will continue and I'm sure that all of our, our friends and our supporters and especially those when that they are they are here and we will continue and we will continue to be the wise, not only the wise of women of Afghanistan, we really want to be the wise of people of Afghanistan. And uh, as I see like we are still at the beginning, we have a long way to go forward. And I'm so glad that we right now we see a lot of young generations, especially boys, that they are also interested to join this uh, lobby and advocacy, and they wanted to be at the front line to raise the rights of people and to raise the rights of women. And we will continue, and uh, we don't see that all with all these wars that we have done a lot, but we will continue uh, together, stronger, and we will be, inshallah, like at the front line and to protect all those rights that the women and uh, have. Um, willing to have access to the rice, and we want to protect and we want to uh, continue our struggle. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I think you highlighted something very interesting. The Taliban seem to be an exclusively a male movement, um, uh, given the reaction they had to your request to talk to women Taliban, if such a thing, such a group exists uh, or not, because sometimes Taliban represent themselves as a national movement. And 50% of the nation seem not seems to be completely absent, uh, and kind of it creates an, an interesting uh, problem with with regard to dialogue, uh, since there is no female. Uh, not that women Afghan women need to only talk to uh, a woman, but it would be interesting that the, there is no female um, kind of uh, analog to the Afghan negotiation side to talk to even. Uh, um, th thank you very much uh, for that insightful answer, um, Dr. Sa uh, Saeed. Um, uh, and a theme uh, in the position paper was the issue of gender justice, uh, both as a part of the peace process and also as a as part of the current political system or a future political system uh, that is going to emerge. Can you enlighten us as to why gender justice? What, first of all, what we mean by gender justice, and second of all, why is this such an important issue uh, that we should keep in mind and uh, to, throughout the peace process? 
Thank you very much, Dr. Sebrini, for the question. Greetings to all. Um, I would also like to thank the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission for organizing this very important and timely discussion and the invitation. Um, and it's a pleasure and honor to be among this uh, distinguished panelists. Um, well, um, a quick word about gender justice. Uh, why do we even talk about it? This is because the unequal and um, discriminatory treatment of women globally in all sectors. Just to give a couple of quick examples, um, globally, um, only 24% of parliamentarians are women. 5% um, of mayors are women. A two thirds of adults, uh, illiterate population are women. Um, so these are, and, and it goes on. Um, and these are staggering statistics globally. Uh, and gender justice, obviously in this uh, context is in, 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 let's say more conventional situation is, is, is needed. Uh, it is being advocated for everywhere. Um, and what it means basically, I mean, it's a concept of uh, uh, demanding full equality and equity uh, between men and women, uh, as well as uh, change and transformation in gender power relationship uh, and um, societal transformation, uh, in, especially in the structures that underlie um, such discriminatory practices. So if you look at the concept um, and how it's being practiced, uh, it's actually um, quite transforming in itself, transformative in itself, because it does deal with power structure. And at the end of the day, that's what needs to change if you want to change basically this unequal gender dynamic. Um, this is about the concept just in a nutshell. The same also applies in the context of peace process. Um, just as I mentioned some statistics globally uh, in other sectors in peace negotiations, uh, the um, average uh, global participation of women is only 8%. Uh, and this is shocking because uh, research shows that women and children are basically disproportionately uh, affected in during violent conflicts. Um, women, for example, suffer um, further um, on top of uh, patriarch patriarchal uh, practices in every society that are you know, structured, unfortunately. Um, they suffer from gender-based violence. Um, they suffer as internally displaced uh, people. Uh, I mean, they suffer additionally. Of course, everybody suffers as an IDP population or as a disabled, um, um, or yeah, you know, in, in other situations affected um, uh, by by the, by the conflict. But we, for women in every context, this is double. Um, coming to the specific situation of Afghanistan, uh, we know that Afghan women have suffered, unfortunately, uh, historically from um, from a very patriarchal. Uh, society, but during the conflict, just to give you know a couple of statistics, um, over there are over two million war widows. Um, more than eighty percent of Afghans um, um, are they, they, they are diagnosed with some form of uh, physical, mental, or sensory impairment. Impairment, and obviously half of them are women. And research also has shown that those suffering from severe um, impairment, especially mental illnesses, are women. Um, so uh, we see that women uh, in, in the context of Afghanistan also as disabled as the IDP communities, there is plenty of research that shows how they, are, how they suffer. Um, I, for example, talk myself with IDP communities um, in different parts of Afghanistan where they say, well, when they were in their own villages or cities, they at least could go to school, they could work, but as IDPs, uh, these are very limited, such opportunities are very limited for them. Um, so therefore, gender justice in this context is um, crucial. It has to be a very important and central component of victim-centered justice um, that has uh, been gaining momentum in Afghanistan, luckily. Um, I would say that victim-centered justice um, in Afghanistan could be um, considered as a component, as a part of transformative justice, which is what I have uh, been researching. Actually, in my own research, the conclusion I have reached, um, because transformative justice comes um, as a concept 
um, not yet so much maybe as a practice uh, from uh, the discourse and practice of transitional justice, or rather from more, to be more precise, from the um, many criticisms that are um, uh, directed to us, uh, transitional justice as being top, top down, as being focused on addressing civil and political rights alone, as not addressing structural issues and equalities. Um, and transformative justice is exactly um, arguing for the opposite. That's what we need in, in societies in conflict if we want to meaningfully end conflict, if we want to uh, meaningfully reach peace and reconciliation. Uh, so I think that the victim-centered justice movement in Afghanistan is a really important development in that direction. However, gender justice has not yet made its place as a central component of that discourse. And it has to be, it has to be done because um, uh, it's true that there are many, um, many discussions, many, many activism, as we heard from our colleagues, um, luckily the women of Afghanistan, uh, whether as negotiators, whether as civil society activists, uh, in other levels, uh, you know, they have been a forceful um, um, component in, in, in the current ongoing situation. Of course, very concerned for what can, um, what can come in, in the next, uh, you know, political development. But in that discourse, the place of women as war victims in this kind of double oppression that they have been suffer suffering I think is lacking a little to more central central stage. Thank you. Thank you. Stop of course, we'll, back, uh, we'll talk about this issue more. As you said, it's an important and should be a central issue, which often is ignored, as you pointed out. Political civil rights or um, political actors, which are often narrowly defined, are uh, have been often the focus, not the victims, which are uh, uh, part women are have a particular position uh, as a victim. Uh, Ms. Barr, uh, the issues of international community has uh, come up uh, so many times so far, and you've been. Uh, in your writing and your advocacy, you've been highlighting how the withdrawal of foreign uh, forces from Afghanistan has been accompanied with a decreased interest on issues of women rights, humanitarian issues in Afghanistan, matched with decrease and decrease in funding. Uh, after all, to get things done, you need resources. How do you assess that change happening, and what are your thoughts in terms of moving forward? What will be the main challenges uh, for the issues of women rights? Uh, with regard to the role of international community without the foreign troops being present on the ground. Um, thank you so much. And, and it's such a pleasure to be here and see so many old friends. And yeah, it's really an honor to be part of this discussion. So thank you. Um, I, <laughs> Dr. Nemat has, has said some of the points I wanted to, to say already. But one thing I was thinking about as I was thinking about how to answer this question is as many of you have probably seen, Antonio Guterres has just been appointed again as um, Secretary General of the United Nations in a completely untransparent process. Um, as you know, the, the ninth man to serve in this job in 75 years, no women ever. Um, and so my organization, we were thinking a little bit about how do we feel about this? And one useful resource we found is that there's an organization called the International Center for Research on Women which has given Mr. Guterres a grade every year for how well he's done on women's rights in his role as secretary general. So his grades have varied from a C plus to a B. Uh, and I thought maybe this is a useful model for us to use and maybe we should give a, a grade to the international community as a whole and individual international actors each year on, on how they're doing. Um, and so I was thinking, well, what grade would I give the international community? And I think maybe overall I would go for a C plus, but that's falling quickly. Um, so maybe it's a C minus so far this year for a lot of the reasons that um, you've talked about, Ursula. Um, you, you didn't say his name out loud, but, but I will. I think that Zalmay Halilzad has played a particularly unhelpful role in this really very dismissive comments that he's made um, frequently, regularly over the years about women's rights or saying that's a problem for Afghans to deal with, not really, nothing to do with us really, um, which you know, as an American, I find pretty shocking because I remember how all the pictures of women in burqas were used to convince me, an American taxpayer, that um, this was a war that um, you know, the US needed to engage in to rescue women. Um, but that seems to not be at the front of anyone's mind at the moment as the, as the US hastily leaves. Um, 
I think looking back over the last 20 years, um, the international community has signed with the hard work um, of women's rights activists in Afghanistan, which you've talked about, Mari, um, has, has created opportunities and has created change. But what has never accompanied that money is political will. Um, so there's never really been a willingness when the SRSG was going to meet with the president or the ambassador was going to meet with the president to, to really say, no, like what's happening with women's rights is not acceptable. Women have to be part of these negotiations. Um, you know, your failure to do things like implement the EVA law is, is really a major concern to, to my organization. Um, so we've seen that, you know, there's been this kind of willingness to write a check, but not a willingness to talk about these issues in kind of the, the highest level discussions, which have usually been discussions between men. Um, and what we see now is that the money is disappearing too. Um, so we published a report about a month ago where we, we documented the fact that funding for the health sector by international donors fell 26% between 2013 and 2019. And we looked at how that's actually affecting individual patients who are trying to get health care and cutting a lot of women off from care. The overall international funding actually fell by 41% during that time period. So it's, it's not even an issue about funding falling off the cliff as the troops leave. It's, it's already falling off the cliff and it's gonna fall faster um, now that the troops are gone. Um, or going. And I, I think my real fear at this moment is, is just a kind of overall disengagement where um, the international community sort of says to itself, well, we tried our very best, but you know, there are some problems no one can solve and lots of other people have problems and we're short on money now because of COVID and we wish them all the best and, and good luck to all of those people in Afghanistan. So I'm afraid that in the years ahead, that, that may be a D or an F. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. No, that is a very, um, that's a very good point. Um, I mean, if I just highlight the need to make sure that the issues of uh, women's rights in Afghanistan are remain front and center uh, in the conversation that are happening everywhere in the world. Um, because politicians, as you said, would like to um, kind of consider this as a case closed, um, not as an ongoing issue uh, as political priorities shift. Uh, but thank you very much for that, uh, uh, for that answer. Uh, Dr. Nehmet, since uh, you may have to leave us a little bit early, uh, I would like to ask this question uh, from you. Uh, the reality is that the violence is intensifying in the country. We are talking about the peace, but the reality of today's Afghanistan is increased violence. And also another reality is that women are often a, a main group of victim of these violence, uh, the kind of violence that is intensifying as the fight is getting into cities, to rural villages, into people's homes, actually. Uh, how do you think, what do you think can be done, should be done at this stage to uh, protect women uh, and children and other vulnerable groups in this phase that we are in, especially with regard to women in rural Afghanistan? I mean, the issue is that when something happens in the city, all the cameras are on there, all the, everything gets reported, there is easy to mobilize people, international community is back, uh, is behind it. But when something happens in a faraway village, there's not as much visibility and often the cries of those women actually goes unheard. How do you think we should approach this moment in, uh, in war in terms of protecting women and other women? Thank you, uh, Dr. Sadrahimi. And my apologies that I have to leave at uh, sharp at three for another uh, a meeting that, I, uh, uh, that I'm uh, having. Um, Thank you for making this question, really, and highlighting the, 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 the issue of the rural urban uh, sort of discussion when it comes to women's rights uh, in Afghanistan. Um, I mean, before looking into the mechanisms, I have to sort of use this opportunity to also talk very briefly about the women in the rural areas. We often talk about, you know, the past 20 years, the achievements of the past 20 years, the failures of the past 20 years years and so on and so forth. And there are different ways of really finding facts for both, how Afghanistan society in the rural context have changed and how it hasn't really changed. Both, for both, you can have plenty of arguments, plenty of literature, plenty of discussions. 
the major fact that I think uh, as we are using this platform of the Independent Human Rights Commission, I want to highlight is that the change in the Afghan society, rural and urban, has happened. The rural women are no longer the women without access to the world, without access to the region, without access to media, without access to even internet. And I mean, it is dependent on context, obviously, but in general, as we say in the uh, local terms, the eyes and ears of the rural woman are open now. They cannot be, I mean, the, the daughter of a mullah cannot be convinced to sit, sit at home and not go to the uh, neighborhood school, you know, like simple as this, to put it. So this issue of women's rights becoming a limited uh, achievement for a limited Western educated Kabul urban uh, urbanized or Mazar urbanized or Herat urbanized girls is completely uh, uh, wrong. And uh, I fully challenge it for all different reasons. Uh, I, I find in different platforms uh, in the past years, I find the rural women more vocal, more active, the provincial women especially. Uh, I find them more brave actually than, than us you know, in Kabul with all the protections that we have, with all the attention that we receive with all the sort of luxuries in the life that we have. I find them much more brave and much more determined to women. I actually have to confess, and I have always said, I've learned more determination and strength from those women than, than women in um, urban settings who are some, somehow compromising with you know, dress code, compromising with a lot of things. So in sum, I'm highlighting this in a very serious level because I believe this also challenges some organizations, some institutions who are kind of quite strongly pushing for a possibility of a special privilege to be given to women's rights activists and women's rights leaders to airlift them or to take them out of Afghanistan. We are estimated to be 32 million, half of this are women. You cannot take half of the population of, of Afghanistan. I have another proposal for people who consider that. Take the, 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 the remnant, take the, the leaders who you have created with your resources who turn against women in Afghanistan. Whether it is Taliban or warlords or drug lords or anyone, even technocrats who are against women, take them out of Afghanistan. We and the people at the community level will find ways to, to find a solution for us, really. I'm putting it at that sort of level. Secondly, when it comes to general what needs to be done, I think it's important to uh, uh, highlight here something that I have also emphasized a lot um, supporting uh, independent human rights commission's position on calling for an international independent investigation on uh, 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 targeted assassinations. Women have been targeted in an, in, a, in an unprecedented, followed the news within two weeks, we had seven women being targeted. What else are we waiting for? And if the Independent Human Rights Co Commission of Afghanistan raising their call for an independent uh, investigation, that means that international community has an obligation to respond because at national level, it's beyond their possibility to move forward with investigations. If it is a matter of threat to their own lives and we all are aware of the fact that they cannot investigate the Human Rights Commission offices in provincial level because of the threat to their lives. We have witnessed how they have been killed and how they have been targeted. So through this platform, I want to emphasize that that call is unilateral in the human rights community, in the civil society community. In this call, I can see a lot of distinguished members of Afghan civil society. I hope they also join their voices to call for an independent investigation because we need to know who is behind this and for what reason. We don't understand this Daesh claiming the responsibility for this and that event. That is nothing. There has to be specific international. Secondly, the government of Afghanistan also needs to go beyond statements, really, calling it a heinous attack, calling it this and that. They really need to prove that in the same way when they confront the Taliban that they are taking the side of the Afghan woman, they have to also ensure that women leaders, women journalists, women civil society activists, who ordinary women are protected. If they receive messages of threats, then this is addressed in a very thorough uh, to, uh, process uh, in ensuring them. And finally, my recommendation is specifically for women leaders, for women groups. We have had this discussions for as long as I remember. Uh, it's um, probably going back for very long. I think this is a time more than any time in the past 20 to 30 years that we need to emphasize on community engagement. 
Uh, we at ARU have taken the lead on, on doing some research on, on gender and masculinity, the role of men in the societies ensuring the support for women. I think we have to really emphasize the future of Afghanistan cannot be simply disconnected from its past and in, in both past of the pre-2001 context and past of the last two, two, 20 years, I think as we move ahead and as we move forward, it is really critical for women leaders to have, have more engagement with community leader, leaders. And we saw the proof of that because when religious scholars, community leaders supported public calls, they have been targeted. And for that reason, I mean, regardless of that target or vulnerability of the rest of the society in Afghanistan, I think it's the time that we emphasize on building stronger relations at the subnational level, at the local level, and, and, and unify, try to sort of push for messages of un, unification across the country. And in that way, we can really see a more stronger sort of mechanisms being placed. Because honestly, if I now call for government to provide you know five guard per woman leader it's not going to really work and it's not really feasible uh, the best is to have the people on your side and then name and shame anyone whether within the system outside the system against the system who are behind these heinous targeted assassinations so i end my remarks here thank you very much again and i'm really apologizing leaving you as i have to sort of join another call in one minute Thank very you. much, um, Dr. Sabine Ahmed. Uh, on behalf of the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission, and personally, uh, thank you so much for your participation. And um, obviously, your voice, as, as always, um, has been the voice of justice and reason. Uh, Dr. Sabine Sorabi, I don't know if we still have you here with us or not, just because your video is, is turned off. Um, <laughs> what I've been hearing so far is that uh, violence is used as a mean uh, to gain uh, uh, political power in the country. It seems like politics and violence cannot be disengaged from each other, and it's um, a, one is just a tool at the hands of a few. Um, given that, how do you um, assist the prospects of a woman's political participation in the likely scenarios ahead? Um, because um, it seems like a big part of fight, uh, the political fight, seems to be over who's going to have the political power and um, issue of women uh, political participation has been um, a kind of an issue that, although not maybe not explicitly discussed, but it's been the undertoning many of the disagreements that, that are being held. You as a trailblazer, person who actually in the post-2001 system fought to, uh, for political uh, participation of women, how do you see that kind of struggle uh, for political participation of women beyond the peace process in just actual state, uh, the current and the future state uh, playing out? Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sebrahimi. Uh, the time that uh, I was uh, in, in my age and in my uh, time, that uh, the, the number of women that we were on the, to, to move for political, to, to take part on the uh, uh, government uh, uh, governance and, and the uh, political participation on the government, the number of women were, uh, uh, we were a few number. But of course, the, it, on that time, it was the matter of capability, the matter of education. But today is, um, fortunately, we have plenty number of young women that they, are very, they have got high education. They, they have shown their capability. So this is something that really the women in Afghanistan want to have it. Uh, because uh, when it, of course, it comes to the matter of capability, always men, are talking about that, that women are capable or not, uh, they, they are uh, educated enough or not. But of course, uh, when we compare um, women to men, uh, for example, at the local level or the national level, when we compare that, there are so many men that they are not much capable, but they have a kind of party, they have a kind of, uh, um, uh, the, uh, the political uh, people that they are political figure that they are behind them. So that's why they are pushing them, even they are not capable or, or capable or not capable. But unfortunately, um, women do not have this this uh, 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 pressure or this support behind them. So it is women themselves that to do something. First of all, of course, fortunately, we have a, a good number of women that they are capable. First of all, it's very important to have an, a, a very tight network to, to support each other. 
this support, as Marijan and uh, other uh, Dr. Sibnimat also uh, said, that uh, um, the women in the civil society lobbied for a long time, for a long period. This lobby lobbying system should continue. This is it is something that we needed. The advocacy and lobby should continue for uh, for generation. It's not the lobby should be and advocacy should be a kind of uh, uh, professionally. Today we had a course of, of uh, how to advocate and what's advocacy by uh, Malek Sateis. Uh, he Everybody knows uh, him. He is very, very uh, prominent scholar. So we learned a lot that, of course, we did some sort of uh, advocacy, but it, advocacy needs some kind of uh, a special skill for that. No, This is something that we have to learn it how to do this advocacy, how to lobby for the, the women that they have to be on the position, uh, um, uh, the political position or, or in the uh, uh, government system. This is uh, some, and mobilize other women. Awareness uh, is also um, a big tool for us. Uh, as I have heard, of, uh, as I learned from uh, Malek Sitez, uh, the awareness is the power. So that's why we have to empower ourselves by awareness, by education, by skill that after that, the advocacy and lobby should work in a proper time, in a proper place. Thank you very much. That is, that is very, um, uh, very wise. Um, Ms. Akrami, I think um, uh, both Dr. Saeed and uh, Dr. Sarabi highlighted this importance of paying attention to the issues of economic uh, uh, opportunities for women, uh, education opportunities for women, and uh, those issues cannot really be separated from political power. They're all intertwined. And often the issues of social rights, and economic rights uh, uh, are often not, it is not as much attention paid to those issues. What do you think can be done uh, uh, to improve women's access to education and economic, economic opportunities, both in the cities and rural Afghanistan? Thank you so much. I think uh, one of the base needs that which is right now, we have to, to more focus on that. It is increasing financial uh, and technical support uh, for formal and informal education for our girls and boys. It is really desperately needed here right now, because right now most of the budget is going to the war and to other uh, stuff, but no one is considered education. Second, that which has very very important uh, equal access to higher education uh, for uh, both boys and girls inside and outside Afghanistan is needed to support it at the national and international levels. Because right now it is when we see in some regard girls like to go to have easy access to higher education. And we need to do more lobbying advocacy and to educate community and to, to have their support to allow their girls and us where government must to focus on that to how to support this. In regards to economy, as now we see that currently there have uh, more than 2,500 registered women uh, in traditional embroidery, restaurants, school food processing, construction, media, and uh, 2,050 um, male entrepreneurs here in Afghanistan. But right now, we also have around 10 women own a business that women have their experts that they wanted to expect, like... Um, dry fruits, saffron, and they are also trying, they try to do their best. There is also like, uh, in addition to that, uh, from this by woman across the Uh, at local level, uh, especially government, must to, to do and to give them more uh, space. And this, uh, uh, those that they wanted to run a business, there is a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of restriction from government. For example, the tax paying and all this stuff, which is really make the job or 
difficult, but we need to do to perceive and explain women's economic empowerment, other uh, reinforcement. Uh, there is need to especially to do more focus to have equal women have equal access, like uh, 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 such as the social, political, and psychological factors to women economic empowerment must be given equal importance. Because again, like the women, the men, that they have power, they have money, that they have also their businesses, have to, to do and we have to convince the government and they must to provide. Women have the courage to uh, even, uh, as I know some of them, like it's not easy for women, but women have run their businesses. Right now, there is 12 market and 12 provinces of Afghanistan run by women. Which is all those security is one of the biggest challenge for them, but they still continue to uh, keep running their businesses and this, um, although it is in the central level of the provinces, but there is still need for further support uh, to support them. Now, uh, last is like uh, they will not be able to enter to labor markets. Like this is another issue, but we have to, to make it like equally, like to how to equally to support men and women at the economic uh, sectors and particularly women. As I said, that they really need, like uh, again, how to, to encourage them, how to do appreciate their roles, how to support. This is something that we can, and we also have to do encourage women by providing some bazaars and to buy their products. This is another challenge, which is unfortunately people do not uh, trust, and we should do a work on that. And there is need for further development to support businesses, all of us, that how to do, for, for example, how to buy something, some product from the women's uh, company. And uh, this is all that, as I see, that there is a lot of things has done in regards to economic promotion for women's rights, and we still need, and we, again, we have a long way to go, and I just want to stop here. And thank you so much. And there is any other questions, and we are happy to raise. And I want to thank uh, Ms. Barr for raising the realities what the U.S. has done, especially the special envoy of America, what they are doing. And she has just as mentioned, and thank you so much, Barr, for always being our wise and appreciate your efforts and all your works. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Secretary. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Dr. Said, uh, there is issue, I mean, you highlighted in the paper and in your previous remarks, the issue of access to justice. Um, not only access to justice in terms of as a remedy, but also woman participation in the justice sector. So um, a woman a voice is uh, present uh, on the issues of, in, in the ju formal justice sector of Afghanistan, as well as a, a justice Centered peace process that, that may come, um, we are hoping for. How do you think um, that should be approached, the issue of women's participation uh, in the justice sector, as well as women's access to justice, both in uh, oral, uh, rural economy? Uh, thank you. Well, as, as also highlighted in the paper, this area remains to be a major challenge for the women of Afghanistan because um, access to uh, formal justice is really limited. Um, and in formal justice, we know it has its own major challenges. So um, uh, when the, the EVA law, or the Elimination of Violence Against Women law was um, uh, signed and uh, put into force uh, as a presidential decree in 2009, that led to, according to one of its provisions, it led to the establishment of a number of special courts on violence against women. For the time being, Afghanistan has 29 of those courts, which covers um, uh, like 80% of the country. Um, and research shows that there has been some increase in women's access to justice uh, after the establishment of these courts. But at, in the best case scenario, that has remained limited to major cities such as Kabul. Uh, so in the former section, there are a number of challenges that uh, limits women's access to justice, um, starting from the cultural, for example, the issue of man and gairat, you know, there are many families that prefer not to take their cases to formal um, court system because they say, well, it will defame the, my family and they prefer to deal it among themselves to deal it in the community. 
Uh, there is the issue of corruption. As we know, corruption, uh, uh, our the Afghanistan judicial system is one of the most corrupt organs in the country. Um, there is issue of lack of awareness, uh, first of all, about the existence of these courts, their functions, um, and also the procedure. And, and, and then um, uh, the, there is a sheer lack of access. Uh, for example, only in, in 142 out of 400 districts of Afghanistan, there is no court whatsoever, let alone uh, violence against women court. Uh, so um, even if 27 courts were uh, established in some provinces, uh, that doesn't mean that in that province, everybody could, can, can reach it because it's one court maybe in the province of Herat or I, I don't know, another big province and how do you expect people to travel from uh, one quarter of the province to the other with all the challenges that exist also in terms of travel and all that, particularly for women. So I think we can easily see the challenges to achieve, to, to, to access formal justice. Um, in, 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 in some, for example, in Kapisa province, uh, I have some of the information and statistics on this because I'm also the Afghanistan researcher for the OGP, uh, Open Government Partnership, and one of the commitments of Afghanistan was about the establishment of the, uh, the, the EVA law courts. Um, in, in Kapisa, for example, in, in three years, uh, from 2017 to 2019, there were just three cases. Whereas we know the prevalence of violence against women uh, in Afghanistan. Um, so um, the other main challenge is actually uh, having female judges because these uh, special courts should have female judges. And this was highlighted in many interviews to me uh, for the, the, the OGP project, whether by government officials, whether by civil society, uh, because uh, judges in these special courts have to be women. Um, judges were trained, for example, in Kabul, uh, but due to challenges, both security, but also cultural and um, challenges you know, related to norm, um, societal norms, we, these women were not willing to go to provinces. Um, and there could be some provisions for, for that, but as far as I know, according to that uh, time, uh, for example, the establishment of um, as a special maybe residence near to the court for women judges uh, or a special maybe protection system, especially what is considering what is happening now, considering what happened to, you know, to female judges. We know that this, this is also increasingly becoming a target uh, community. So they need even more, you know, a special protection. Um, then just a point about the, um, the informal uh, justice or Shora in Jirga system. I know that uh, you know, most of those in the human rights community uh, probably don't even want to talk about it because they're so patriarchal, they're so exclusive of women, youth, um, and in many cases, um, outright discriminatory, uh, which, which is all true. But at the same time, what I like to say is that they have been there, I mean, they, they have a root, they're pervasive. Uh, people do take their cases to them so my suggestion would be to, to work with them and try to, to fix some of those problems on a draft law. Um, and I've seen that draft law. Uh, there are many provisions in terms of women's rights protection um, against discriminatory ac actions. So I think that could already be a good start, but also as a criminologist who has done some research on restorative justice, I think uh, some maybe elements, provisions of restorative justice could also be helpful in fixing some of the problems with Shora in Jirgas, which in any case, research also shows that there is connection between the sort of justice in these Shoras and in, in, in Jirgas in some ways. And just a very interesting example, I read this a couple of weeks ago, um, this article that in a Shoturum, Shoturum village in Darei Fulodi in Bamyan, there is a woman mediator. Uh, it doesn't say for how long, but she is the, the, village, the village's mediator in these shoras in Jirgas, and people take their cases to her. This probably is one of the most unheard you know, situations, but this is an excellent positive example to show that in shoras in Jirgas, also there should be emphasis on the role of women as mediators, which are fully capable, as we see in the example of Shoturum, which has also made the village more peaceful, more reconciled, 
And men and women take their cases, not just about gender and family issues, but also tensions about, around land. Global data of women's participation in peace process, you know, peace agreements in the uh, once it, it's signed during the implementation that when women participate, there's more possibility for the inclusivity, for um, uh, sustainability, and also implementation. Thank you very much. Thank, no, you. thank you very much. And, and I think that's a very important issue that you highlighted, the issue of women's participation in both formal and informal justice sector. I don't think we can have meaningful woman access to justice unless um, uh, until such time that we have uh, a strong woman uh, presence in the justice sector and institutions, prosecutions, courts, um, defense attorneys, all the way, as well as informal sector. Uh, uh, and sometimes those issues are ignored and we just focus on distance and, and, and other issues, uh, whereas there is an, an institutional, a systemic kind of gap there. Um, uh, and as Professor Abisa said, University of Afghanistan. We have many amazing graduates, and sometimes they want to. They are willing to risk. They have the courage to do it despite all the risks at every stage, and also that woman shouldn't be a judge. The leadership level of these. Institutions, um, but thank you very much, uh, uh, Ms. Barr. You have a kind of a comparative perspective. Do you think um, Afghan Afghanistan uh, can learn uh, from experience of other countries when it comes both to the issue of women's role in the peace process, as well as ensuring women's rights uh, participations are secured uh, in the meantime and in any political situation? What do you think is the lesson for Afghanistan? Um. That's a good question. <laughs> it's not exactly the question I was prepared to answer, but I'll, I'll try and answer it, and then I'll and then I'll answer the question I wanted to answer, uh, which is about what should the international community do. Um, I mean, I think other colleagues have already talked about. Um, I mean, you, Professor Said, and others have talked about the lessons that we have about peace building from all around the world, and where whichever country you go to and do research on. Um, you always find the same thing, which is having women involved in the peace process makes it more likely that you reach a deal, makes it more likely that that deal is successful. And so not learning that lesson, um, you know, on the part of people like the U.S. government is, is pretty unforgivable at this point. Um, I think that, you know, another lesson is, is about, um, you know, is about money. Um, and I I want to talk about money in a second. You know, a government can't survive without money, and a government can't um, can't meet the needs of its people without money. Um, so I'm going to switch now to the the answer I the question I wanted to answer, which is what should the international community do? So as Human Rights Watch, we have sort of three key points that we're making to um, donor and to troop contributing countries at this moment, and I, I just came actually right before this from a meeting with the German government, um, which is one of many governments to whom we're conveying these messages. So the first message is about accountability. Um, several people on this call have mentioned the, the request that the AIHRC has made for a fact-finding mission or commission of inquiry to investigate um, attacks on civilians, targeted attacks, and to fill the gap that's being left by the fact that the Afghan government seems to have completely given up on investing that. Um, so, so we completely support that call by the AIHRC. Um, we think it's really important and we think it's a responsibility of the international community and they, they need to support this. Um, the second issue is money. Um, I think that um, there has to be the money and Mari, you've talked about um, the need to invest in education. Education and healthcare are absolutely fundamental. Women can't realize any of their other rights if they can't educate their daughters and have safe access to healthcare for them, themselves and their family. The Afghan government's budget is more than three quarters funded by international donors. Um, so every cost lives and build their education. So a really major priority for us is saying that those funds can't be cut off 
And no matter what's happening with the security situation, no matter what's happening with the Taliban control, um, you can still deliver those services and you have to. Um, and then the third point that we're making, I, I really appreciate Orzula's comments so much about how we should focus on getting specific people out of Afghanistan as opposed to ridiculous ideas like uh, evacuating all women. But, but we are saying to countries um, that they need to examine their own policies with regard to refugees and asylum um, and that they do have a responsibility to people who have um, put their lives at risk by helping to support countries that are now running for the exits. And so whether that's um, the SIV visas for interpreters, whether that's how they deal with people who arrive in their country as asylum seekers, and also looking at gender considerations in making those decisions about asylum, thinking hard about risks that someone may have faced as a woman who's a journalist or as a woman who's a women's rights activist um, and so on and so forth. So sorry if I didn't answer the question thank you wanted. Thank you very much. No, thank you very much. I'm make sure to make. Of course, no, of course. Thank you very much uh, for those comments. Um, we are nearing the end of the discussion um, and this has been a conversation about the position paper that the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission has put out as a way of articulating their position on the issues of women's rights in the context of peace process and also beyond. So as a last comment, I would like um, each speaker to share their thoughts as to what they think Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission should be doing um, in terms of uh, promoting uh, women's rights, participation, also aspiration in the context of peace process and beyond. And we can start with uh, Ms. Barr, um, since you were the last speaker, and then we, uh, um, we're going to go to uh, other speakers as well. Uh, please keep your remarks short because we want to end on time. Thanks so much. Um, as I've already Said, I think that this call for um, international investigation of attacks on civilians is incredibly important. And another thing I would love to see the AIHRC do is monitor um, the availability of essential services like education and healthcare on the ground and raise the alarm and, and work with groups like mine to embarrass donors if we see that those services are. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Tabsarabi, if you. Tarabi, if you want to start. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, just I want to um, uh, highlight about the, the, the recommendation that the Human Rights Commission giving about the IDPs and, and some other concern that want, especially for the, uh, for the uh, negotiating team. If uh, this the recommendation can be a, a part of a paper that uh, this recommendation uh, should send uh, uh, officially to uh, the negotiating team in ministry uh, or uh, um, uh, high, high commission for reconciliation. This is one. And also, uh, there should uh, be a specific paper for, for this. For example, some of the organization gave us the, uh, a specific paper, uh, policy paper for inclusion. This IDP and this uh, the, the, this recommendation also can be a kind of a specific paper on the detail that uh, what should be we consider uh, if we can if we can have it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna Um uh, Ms. Akremi, if you would like. To uh, thank you so much. First of all, thank you so much for uh, your great moderation and as well for my colleagues from Independent Human Rights Commission to organize. Uh, my recommendation to Human Rights Commission has their role that they, are, they should do more focus on the monitoring and especially for the uh, um, make, a, a, I'm sure that they're part of that systems, but they have more than open hand for the do more inquiry on the um, uh, violence against the uh, human rights defenders, and this is very, very important, and they, they should do more. Uh, and based on that, and I'm sure that we are all working together, but it is as uh, independent human rights commission have uh, like more than louder uh, wise that they could do more in this regard, uh, work with government and especially with the international community that how to provide protection for the human rights defenders and particularly for the women human rights defenders. Thank you. I would like to actually echo that as well, because uh, as many uh, pointed out, the, there's been a shift uh, with regard to human rights discourse in Afghanistan uh, and um, uh, in response to the uh, withdrawal for foreign forces and international support, some uh, uh, previous allies have, uh, have been uh, more critical uh, um, as the political power shifts 
So it becomes even more important to uh, protect uh, human rights defenders um, uh, who are actually risking their lives uh, for the benefit of all of us. Thank you very much, Ms. Sekremi, for that. Uh, thank you. Um, quickly, three points. Um, uh, the Human Rights Commission has been uh, conducting very valuable research, uh, which some of which I've used also in the paper, obviously, um, in, in overall during the years. Um, I hope that that research continues with um, on, on women's perspectives, particularly in the current context, but really from bottom up perspective, because sometimes, you know, there, there are these discussions that we don't know much about the perspectives of women from the ground, from, proven, from provinces, from villages. Um, so I hope there would be a, a bit more on that, even if it's like short, but it's always really valuable and especially in this time period. Um, uh, pushing more for gender justice in the context of victim-centered justice. As I was also saying, the paper does mention it, but I think it, I mean, it, that's just a kind of brief mention, but I think there is really the need, especially in this context as women are being targeted, assassinated, and they're obviously uh, uh, crime um, victims of um, um, war crimes and crimes against humanity and even genocide as we are going on these days with that discussion. Um, and also, um, I, would, I would encourage the commission to engage with you know, the whole Shora Jirga um, dynamic with the aim to kind of influence, affect, and amend some of the, the problems that they have uh, rather than dismissing them and, and as like you know, patriarchal uh, or discriminatory institutions because I don't think we can get rid of them easily, but you know, better to fix them. Thank, thank you. you very much. I would like to also thank everyone. I personally enjoyed greatly this conversation and learned uh, immensely from everyone who spoke. It's been a great privilege um, to be moderating this session.